This is lecture 10 of Computer Science 162. So our topic is uh, caches and translation look-aside buffers today. Um, but before we get into that, I want to uh, do a recap of uh, paging and segmentation-based translation. Let me turn this down a little bit. And uh, then we'll go through multi-level translation and look at caching, uh, what it is, uh, sources of misses, and uh, how we can organize our caches three different ways. And then uh, I'm going to talk about translation look-aside buffers as a way of speeding up the translation process using caching. And then we're going to look at how we can combine caches, memory caches, with translation look-aside buffers into a virtual uh, memory hierarchy. OK. so. Let's start with uh, segments. So here we have our virtual memory view. Right? So this is what a, a process sees. And here we have a segment map that maps us from this virtual view to physical memory. Right? So the uh, first, the stack here is uh, segment 1, 1. And so that's mapped to a, a base of, of 1, 0, 1, 1, and then quadruple 0 with a limit of 1 quadruple zero. And so that maps us to this physical location. Similarly, our heap is uh, segment one zero. And that maps us to zero one 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 zero zero zero. OK, so right here in physical memory. Same thing for our data. That's mapped that's segment zero one, starting at location zero one zero one quadruple zero. OK, so that's this region here. And then finally, our, our code is segment uh, zero. So that maps us to segment 0001, quadruple zero, which is down here. OK? So um, now we can uh, ask questions like, for example, um, what happens if our stack grows? Right? So our stack is growing down, so our stack grows down here. Well, the problem is there's no room for our stack to grow here. So what's going to happen is we'll end up with some kind of segmentation fault pass it to the kernel, and then uh, the kernel will have to do something. Like, for example, uh, move other segments around so that it can uh, make room for the stack to grow. Segments have to be contiguous in physical memory. So as an alternative that gives us a much simpler allocation mechanism, we looked at paging. All right, so with paging, we take our, our virtual memory and we divide it up into fixed size units. So unlike segments, which could be variable sized, pe uh, pages are always a fixed size. We pick it for the particular architecture. So it might be 4 kilobytes, might be 16 kilobytes. It, it depends on uh, the virtual memory architecture, but it's fixed. Right? So all of our allocation is done as uh, a page. You can't allocate less than a page. Uh, if you want to allocate more than a page, then you just simply allocate multiple uh, physical pages. Right? So our allocation now is very, very simple. And uh, the way it works is we have a page table. And the page table maps our virtual page number. So in that case, it's this red portion of the virtual address. Uh, we look it up. So here for our stack, we'd look up uh, quadruple one zero. And quadruple one zero maps to triple one zero zero. So that's right here. So now we can ask the question again, what happens when our stack grows? And here, it's very easy. Right? Even though we don't necessarily have a lot of room here, we only have one free page, we can allocate our pages anywhere. And then just simply make the page table point to the appropriate location. So no longer do we actually have to have our uh, physical regions be contiguous. The only con continuity we need is it's allocated as a single page. But those pages could be scattered throughout memory. And in fact, for a, a typical machine, after you've run a bunch of programs on it, you'll find things are allocated all over the place. But it doesn't matter. From the point of view of the program, it has a nice contiguous virtual address space, which we allocate on demand. So there's lots of blanks here. And when we touch one of those, we'll have to allocate you know, real pages to, to match. All right? So the challenge here is the size of our table is going to be uh, equal to the number of pages that we have in use in virtual, uh, the, that we could have, rather, in virtual memory. So especially when we get to very large uh, architectures, like a 64-bit virtual address space, 
right? Um, if we had to have a page table for that that was all in memory, it, it would be larger than the size of memory <clears throat> that we could afford to buy. Okay? Any questions about segments or pages? Yes. Um, so the question is, what do we do when we have 64-bit address spaces? We use multi-level translation. That's the solution. Um, so we're only going to store entries for those pages that are in use. Um, we can't do that with this approach, right? This approach, we need a full contiguous table. That table has to be actually stored in, in contiguous memory. Any other questions? Okay. So let's look at multi-level translation. So the idea here is rather than just have a single allocation scheme like segments or pages, why not have multiple? We can do one, we can do multiple. So we can build a, a tree of tables basically. So the lowest layer um, could be a page table. The advantage of doing this at the lowest layer is pages are a nice easy unit of allocation. And then higher levels could be segmented. Right? That's one scheme, to have segments at the top level, pages at the next level. Uh, but we, in reality, we could have you know, arbitrary number of labels. So let's say we have a segment top level and then uh, pages at the next level. So here, our virtual address is uh, composed of a virtual segment number, a virtual page number, and an offset within a page. Okay, so remember, with paging, since our lowest level is paging, our offset is an index into the page. There's no addition as we have with segments. It's something that always students get confused with. With segments, we have to add the offset to the base. With paging, the offset is relative to the start of the page. So there's no uh, addition that has to happen. Okay, so what are we gonna do with the rest? So first we need to find uh, the appropriate page table. We're gonna find that by uh, looking up the virtual segment number first. So we take our segment map pointer, which is a register which points to our segment map in memory, and we're going to index into that segment map with our virtual segment number. Okay, so we do that, and in this case, let's say it's uh, based, it's the, uh, the uh, third entry. Right. Uh, so that now returns the location of a page table. And so before the segment was giving us the actual data page. Now it's giving us a page table. Okay, the page table has size limit two. So now we're going to take our virtual page number and we're going to index into that table. So we look up the virtual page number in that, and that now gives us a physical page number since our lowest level scheme is paging. So now we have a physical page number that we can use. All right? Are we done? Not quite. But yes. Okay, very good question. What is the purpose of limit two? The limit here tells us how large this page table is. All right, so the reason why I said we're not quite done yet is we need to check all the bits and the sizes and everything to make sure we actually had a valid translation. So first of all, we have to check to make sure that this virtual page number is not larger than uh, what would be allowed by limit. All right, that is, we ran off the end of the table. We also have to check to make sure that this segment is actually a valid segment, right? Some of these are not, like this one's not valid, right? Then we have to check the page table entry here. So we actually have to check to make sure it's valid, and we have to check that we're actually accessing it the right way. So for example, this one's marked read-write, but you know, if we tried to write to, to page zero, we'd have to generate an error because that page is marked read-only. Okay, everybody follow? Okay, so um, what do we have to save on a context switch and what do we have to restore? Well, if we have a scheme like this where our top level is a segment, then we have to save the segment map pointer register, which tells us where to find the segment uh, table in memory, the segment map. Okay, um, if our top level was a page table, so if we had a page table on top of a page table, and I'll show you a, a picture of that in, in just a few minutes, then we'd have to save the pointer to the top level page table. Right, that would be a register also. So in both cases, we need to just save a register 
in order to, to do our context switch and then restore a register uh, for the new address space. Yes? So what's the benefit of multi-level translation? Ah, so what's the benefit of multi-level translation? So again, if we go back to this example, the challenge here is this table is a contiguous table and the size of this table is it has to have one entry for every page that we could have the, in the virtual address space. So imagine we have a two to the 64 bit address space, you know, 64 bit, uh, or 64 bit address space, so two to the 64 bytes that we could potentially address. And that's broken up into pages that are, I don't know, say 12 bits, right? So we'd need, two, we'd need 64 minus 12, so two to the 64 minus 12 uh, page table entries. That's a lot. Right, that's two to the 52nd, which is a really, really big number. Um, we could not, we, that would consume all of our physical memory that we could potentially have and then some. So even though most of that 64-bit address space would be empty. So what multi-level page tables allow us to do is they allow us to just have page tables representing, uh, or, or segment entries representing the portion of the address space that's in use, right? So large portions here are not in use, right? And the size of this table only has to map the portion of that segment that's actually in use. Right, so if we have segments that are not in use, don't need any, any or if, uh, if we're using a page table on top of page tables, if we have regions that are not in use, they don't have to be mapped, they don't take up any uh, entries. Only when we actually use them do we actually need entries, yes? So the amount of memory, again, is going to be proportional to uh, the number of pages that we have in the virtual address space. Right, so you can just calculate you know, the size of a page, the number of pages that you have, and then you need you know, some number of bytes for each page table entry, like four bytes. It's gonna take a pretty big chunk of memory, exactly. Okay, even for a 32-bit address space, yeah. So base three, that's correct. So if you tried to enter, if you tried to reference uh, uh, the segment uh, for base three, you would generate a segmentation fault because it's marked as invalid. Okay, similarly, if I tried to reference page number six in base two, I would also generate a fault because I'm running off the end of the page table and that's an invalid uh, entry. In fact, I can't even access that because that would be reading a memory location that's not mapped by this segment. Right, this segment only maps a memory region this size. Another question? Yeah. So, um, where does this stuff live? Is this going to stay like where the disks are? Because eventually you're going to need all the. And how do you allocate like a new page? Like, you know, okay, yeah. Page? Very good. Uh, yeah, very good question. So, where do these tables live? So, the top level table always lives in, in memory. And then the lower levels can be paged out to disk. So this means we only need to potentially keep a small amount of our tables in memory, the active portions. When we get into paging, we'll see you know, this in more detail. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure, you first. Yeah, the top level, t whether it's a top level page table or a top level segment table, that always has to be in memory. But it can contain information that tells you, oh, this is located out on disk, so go fetch it from disk. We'll, we'll see a lot more about this um, in Wednesday's lecture when, we, when uh, uh, Professor Canny talks about paging. And then you had a follow up? Okay, so the, the question is, um, when we wanna add a new page, how do we know where we can put it? So we have to maintain a bitmap for all of our physical memory, and it has a bit that tells us whether the page is in use or the page is not in use. If the page is not in use, we can allocate it. So it's much, much simpler than with a segment, a pure segment-based approach. Right, with a pure segment-based approach, we have to maintain these free lists of pages, uh, of memory rather, of varying sizes, and then when we need a memory region of a given size, we have to try and see do we have adjacent regions that we can coalesce that are free, or do we have to move things around? So 
Segments are, are just very, very expensive to, to deal with at, as a lowest layer. So no, no systems today use segment at the lowest layer. Uh, the bitmap will be, uh, so the question is the size of the bitmap. It's going to be proportional to the number of physical pages that you have, right? And so that's a reasonable size. You know, the largest you might have in a modern machine is a terabyte of RAM organized in, say, 16K pages. So you'd need one bit for each one of those pages. Any other questions? Okay. All right, so sharing. Um, we can now do sharing at various granularities. So for example, we could share an entire segment very easily. So in process A, we have our, our virtual address here, and it's going to point to its uh, segment uh, table here, which maps to a uh, base2, in this case, to a segment that we want to share. In process B, we simply have our entry point to the same shared segment. It is not a requirement that they have the same uh, segment, virtual segment number. It could be any of these that we actually map. It could be, you know, base six that gets mapped to it. Doesn't matter, right? Um, what does have to be equivalent is limit. The limit value does have to be equivalent. Right? But this is a very easy way where now these processes could communicate between each other using this shared memory, and they could do that at, at very high bandwidth. Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. Could you have um, different size limits so that you could have an exclusive space at the end of it? Um, no, you wouldn't do that. You'd have, two, you'd have a, a separate segment that was exclusive, say, to, to process A. Yeah. Ah, question is, do both of them have to be valid? Yes, they both have to be valid. Um, again, it gets more complicated when you're doing paging, and you'd have to, you know, if you paged out the page table, then you'd have to mark them both as invalid and on disk. So you have to do reference counting. It gets a lot more complicated when you do sharing of, of memory regions. Yes? Ah, so, very, so the question, uh, that's a good question. How do we prevent sharing? So um, sharing has to be mutual. So they'd have to both register with the kernel that we want to share this region between. So one example might be a, a parent might create a, a, a shared region and then fork a child. So the child also has a handle to the, the shared region. There's a follow-up question? Uh, the question is if they're, so again, if, if uh, they're both not valid because there really is no valid segment, then you can't share. Um, if they're both not valid because it's actually sitting out on disk, then that's completely reasonable. And, the page fault handler will just simply pull the, the page in when either one of them uh, references the, the page table. Okay, um, we can, uh, so an, another very common, in fact, what most systems use is um, page, pa uh, two level paging hierarchy. So here we have our page table pointer and it points to a top level page table. We're going to say our entries here, are, are our page table entries are four bytes in size. And our virtual address now is split up into uh, two sets of virtual page numbers. The first set refers to the top level table. The second set refers to the second level page table. And then we have our offset as, as before. So we've taken our 32-bit address and we've split it up into 12 bits of offset, 10 bits of uh, virtual page number two, and 10 bits of virtual page number one. All right, so now our tables are fixed size. They, are, they have um, 1024 entries, 1,024 entries. And um, you could have probably figured that out on your own looking at this. How? What's the size of a page? How many bits on a page or for refer indexing a bit into a page? 12, okay. What's 2 to the 12? Sounds like a good exam question, 2 to the 12. Uh, 4,096, okay? What's 4,096 divided by a four-byte page table entry? 1,024, 
Okay, so that's the size of these tables is 1,024 entries. Don't be surprised if you see a question like this on the midterm. Right? Also, we might say, you know, how do you construct your virtual address uh, division between offset uh, um, virtual page number two and virtual page number one? Right? How many bits do you allocate to each other? Right? Well, in this case, if there are 1024 entries, then you need 10 bits, two to the 10 is 1024, in order to reference it. So that means each one of these has to be 10 bits. All right, so um, we use the page table that we get from the top level page table from our, our indexing it with the virtual page number one to find our second level page table, which we index into with our virtual page number two, and that gives us our actual page. We use the offset to index into that page. Okay? So that's two level pages. Now, we need um, valid bits on all of these uh, uh, page table entries because we don't need every second level table. Right? So this is really good for sparse address spaces. And um, even when they exist, these second level page tables can be out on the disk if they're not being used. Right? So we can page them out. Right? So two different schemes that we can use, segments and pages, or pages and pages for dealing with very large uh, sparse address spaces. And this is the most common one in use today. Yes? Okay, what's the difference between segments and pages and pages and pages? So a segment is a variable sized region, whereas a page is a fixed size region. So each one of these entries here points to a fixed size page table, a 1024 uh, entry page table, one page. Right? Whereas with segments, we could point to a variable size page table because we could specify the limit to tell us how large that page table was. Okay, so here's a summary of uh, how paging uh, in two-level page tables works. So let's say I want to resolve the following address, right? So we, we've broken up, broken up our address into an italicized red page number one, a non-italicized green page uh, table, a page, virtual page number two, and in blue is three bits of offset. Okay, so if we want to resolve this address, we're first going to look up the first three bits, 100, zero, zero, in our top level page table. So that's going to be right there. That's going to be that one. Okay? Then we have to read our, net. that gives us a pointer to our second level table, and we're going to index into that with these two bits, the one and zero in green. So that's going to be this entry here. So we're going to read that entry. That's going to give us the page table entry that's going to give us the physical page number of the actual data. Okay, and so that is right there. All right, so big challenge here is for, so the best case is our total so size in terms of the number of page tables is gonna be the number of pages used by the program in virtual memory. Right, so again, great for sparse address spaces. The downside is we have to do two additional memory accesses for each reference, right? In order to read this location, we had to read this entry in this page table, and we had to read this entry in this page table. So that's kind of expensive. Question? Um, so in this case, each, uh, the question is what is each entry here? Um, typically, it would be a, a page table entry, so it's going to be some number of bytes. Typically, you know, it could be four bytes or, or eight bytes. In physical memory, yeah. It's gonna be very architecture specific. Different architectures are gonna store different bits. We'll see when we get into paging that we have, uh, you know, was it recently accessed, like a use bit, we have dirty bits, you know, we have all sorts of bits that we'll maintain. Um, you could also have access control bits like uh, it's read only or you can write it or it's execute only and so on. Question? Ah, so um, the question is, if I want to access multiple addresses on this page, do I have to perform the translation each time? So far, as we've seen, yes. 
right? So our machine is going to run substantially slower than we would like. We'll figure out, you know, if I ever get to it, we're, <laughs> we're going to figure out how we can use caching to, uh, to remember that operation. So we're not just going to use caching to remember the contents of memory, but we're also going to use it to remember a process like address translation. You know, we start out with this virtual page number, 10010, and we end up with this physical page number, 10000. Right? So we might want to remember that if we're accessing that page a lot. Question? So each entry here points, to, in each of these page tables, points to a page, in this case, in physical memory. Uh, it need not reside in physical memory, though, because we can page it out to disk. OK. So some of the advantage. So the advantage here is we only have to allocate as much in terms of uh, page table structures as we're actually using. You know, it's going to be proportional to the amount of uh, of usage that we have of our virtual memory. So sparse address spaces are trivial to do with this, and they're going to be space efficient. Very easy memory allocation, because at the lowest level, we're using pages. So we don't have to worry about best fit or buddy fit or you know, some other kind of algorithm and compaction and moving things around. We'll never have to do that. We get very easy sharing. We could either share at the segment level, or we could share individual pages. But of course, if we're doing sharing, we have to do reference counting. So we can figure out when it's OK to deallocate uh, a memory region. But there are a lot of disadvantages. So we have one pointer per page. So that's typically you know, for 4 to 16 kilobyte pages. So when we start to have machines that have a terabyte of memory, that is actually a lot of pointers that we could potentially have to uh, maintain. Um, these page tables, and especially when those are 64-bit address machines, these page tables have to be contiguous. Um, but the examples I showed you, the page table is only one page. But page tables could be definitely much larger than, than a single page. And we have to do a lot of memory lookups. So we're doing three memory lookups for each reference, including the reference itself. So that's very expensive. Right? We have to look in the first level table, look in the second level table, and then we could actually read the thing we wanted to read. So that's, that's not good. OK. so. In summary, uh, segments are, are good because we can do very fast context switching. Um, we, uh, the disadvantage is we have external fragmentation. Um, paging with a single level doesn't have external fragmentation and has very fast and easy allocation. But the downside is the table size is going to be proportional to the virtual memory size. So this doesn't work for large uh, address spaces like 64-bit address spaces. And we looked at two different multi-level schemes. And here now, the table size is proportional to the amount of virtual memory that's actually in use. That's good. Um, and we get fast and easy allocation since the lower level is pages. Um, downside, lots of memory references to do each reference to memory. Because we have to read either the, the segment table, or we have to read the top level page table, then we have to read the second level page table, then we actually get to read the thing we're looking to read. So, very easy solution, and the rest of this lecture is all going to be about this solution. So caching is um, just a, a way of having a copy that we can access faster than the original. So the goal here is to make the, the frequent case very fast and the infrequent case cost thus less dominant. Because right? the infrequent case is going to be when we have to go and fetch the original. That's going to be really expensive. We don't want that to dominate our access cost. So we can cache at many different levels. We can cache memory locations. We can cache address translations. This is what we're going to talk about today. We can cache pages. We can cache file blocks. Uh, pages we'll see on Wednesday. File blocks and file names and network routes and, and so on. Everything in, in a computer relies on caching for good performance. From the system level, from the chip level, all the way up to uh, the application level. Now, caching will only work if the frequent case is frequent enough. If it's infrequent, caching's not going to help. And if the infrequent case is not too expensive. If the infrequent case is ridiculously expensive, caching isn't going to help. Because in those rare times that you go and have to do the infrequent case, those, that's just going to dominate your total time. 
Now, an important measure for a cache is what is the average, uh, for a memory hierarchy or for any system involving caching, is what's the average access time? The average access time has two components. The first component is the hit rate times the hit time. So that's when you find it in the cache, what's the time to access it in the cache, plus the miss rate, so when you don't find it in the cache, what fraction of time, um, times the cost when you have to fetch the original. Right? So example. So let's say we have data in memory and we don't have a cache. Our access time to memory is 100 nanoseconds. So our average access time, 100 nanoseconds. So let's add a cache. So we're gonna add a second level uh, static RAM cache, much faster than dynamic RAM. We're gonna say this has a time ac to access of 10 nanoseconds. Our time to go to main memory is 100 nanoseconds. All right, so <clears throat> our, hit, uh, our average access time again is our hit rate times our hit time plus our miss rate times our miss time. Key thing, the hit rate and the miss rate have to sum up to one, right? Because either we find it in the cache or we don't find it in the cache and we miss. So let's look at different uh, hit rates. So what if our hit rate is 90%? What's gonna be our average access time? Any clues? So what is 0.9, okay? times our hit time, 10 nanoseconds, equals nine. And our miss rate is one minus our hit rate. So 0.1 times 100 is 10, okay? So we end up with nine plus 10, 19. Okay, so we're doing much better than 100 nanoseconds, but we're not doing quite as well. We're at almost double our access time for the uh, cache. Yes? That's a good question. So the question is, um, do we also need to include the time to look in the cache? Absolutely. So I'm assuming in this case that the time to look in the cache is uh, included in the time to access memory. And there are many ways you could do that, like by doing it in parallel. Was there a question in the back? Okay. All right, what if we increase the hit rate to 99%? What's our average access time going to be now? So it would be 0.99 times 10, right? So that's going to be 9.9 .9 plus 0 0.99, or 0.01 rather, times uh, 100 nanoseconds. All right, so we'll end up with one. So 9.9 plus 1, 10.9. Right, so now we're getting much, much closer to performing like our cache instead of performing like our slow memory. Now we can take this and look at it in the context of a computer, and a computer, it's not just one hierarchy, rather it's an array of hierarchies, right? We have registers, which we can access in fractions of a nanosecond, L1 caches, which we can access in, in nanoseconds. And as we go up the hierarchy, sizes go up pretty dramatically, right? So we go from having a few hundreds of bytes that we store in registers all the way up to terabytes that we can store in a disk, right? But accessing the disk is taking tens of thousands of nanoseconds versus fractions of a nanosecond. So our goal here with caching is we want to give you basically as much memory as we can in the cheapest technology, so that would be disk is really, really cheap relative to everything else. Memory is, is more uh, ex uh, cheaper rather than uh, on-chip memory and so on. Um, but we want to give you the access speed of the far left. Right? So we want you to have the illusion that you have huge amounts of space that you can access at chip speeds. So that's what caching is all about is sort of perpetuating this, this uh, illusion. Okay, now, can we actually do this? Does caching actually work? The answer is yes, and the reason why is one word, locality. So if we look at our address space, let's say this is our virtual address space, and we look at the probability of a reference, 
And so sort of what fraction of our references are going where? We notice a peak. Right? In fact, we notice a couple of peaks. These have two, there are two aspects to these peaks. One is temporal locality. So if we've accessed something recently, we're more likely to access it again in the future. So that's locality and time. The second is spatial locality. And that is if we access something, we're likely to access something near it in the future. So that's spatial, uh, that's uh, locality and space. So our, typically we'll find in any system, you know, if caching is going to work, we either have temporal locality or spatial locality or we have both. So again, our illusion here is we want to, you know, move contiguous blocks from uh, lower memory to upper memory so that we get this illusion that we're operating at the uh, upper memory speeds. And if we've accessed something that's in our upper memory, we're likely to act in the past, we're likely to access it again in the future. And we're moving by block because if we access something near something, we're likely to access something near that in the future. All right, so our unit of transfer will be these blocks. And we'll see this when we look at, at caches and cache lines. Yeah. No. So the, the question is, when we have a page table and it's mapping um, pages to opposite ends of the address space, does this break, you know, for example, spatial locality? So we'll have spatial locality within the page, and when we cross a page boundary, it doesn't matter where that physical page is located in memory. Right? There's not, all pages in memory are equally, f in physical memory, are equally far from the processor. So we'll pull, we can pull them in you know, a block at a time. You know, or if we're pulling them in from disk, they're sort of all equally far away. Or we think of them that, that way. Especially with SSDs, that's true. Okay. So when does caching not work? Well, caching doesn't work when we don't find the item in the cache. So let's ask a question. Um, why might we not find an item in the cache? Any ideas? Yeah. Right, so, so th exactly. The cache is already full, so we would take what's called a capacity miss. Right? The item's not in the cache because it got bumped out of the cache by, by something else. What would be another one? Yeah. Uh, yes, so if we've never accessed something before, it's not going to be in the cache. So that's actually called, that's our first miss. That's a cold start or compulsory miss. So the first time you reference something, you have to load it into the cache. Right? So when we look at a, across a, a program's execution, its entire execution, we're never going to be able to have 100% hit rate because of compulsory misses. Now, if we're running billions of instructions, cold start misses don't really matter because right? they're going to happen in the beginning. And then, you know, if we look over a, a window of time, we could actually see 100% um, hit rate. Okay? So our second one is the one that was mentioned in the back, which is capacity. So we can't contain all of the blocks that are going to be accessed by the program. The solution here is just to simply make our cache larger. Um, there is a solution actually to, to uh, compulsory misses, which is we could just preload everything. But the downside of preloading is that's going to delay us from starting execution. And uh, you know, it's usually faster to just page in on, on demand. Next uh, set of misses is conflict or collision misses. So this is where multiple memory locations map to the same location in the cache. And the solution here is to make the cache bigger or to increase the associativity of the cache. So we'll see this when we go through the different organizations for, for cache. And then two other uh, types of, of misses which um, we're really uh, you know, not going to look at as much in this class. Um, one is coherence misses. And this is um, where an entry in the cache gets invalidated because another processor or another core or an I.O. device modifies the item in uh, memory. So we have to invalidate it. <clears throat> the last one is a uh, policy miss. And this is where um, we pick the wrong item to replace when we have a, a capacity issue. And we pick the wrong item because then it gets referenced, you know, a short time while, a uh, short time later. An optimal policy would have picked something else to, to replace. So there's a bunch of questions we can ask uh, when we have a cache. 
So let's say we have um, an 8-byte cache here. We have a 32-byte memory. And our block in this case is going to be one byte. And so our unit of transfer from memory into the cache is going to be uh, just one byte. We're going to assume the CPU accesses the following location, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0. So first question we want to ask is, is that byte cached? All right. So here's the byte in memory. Is it stored in our cache? The second question we want to ask is, if it isn't stored in our cache, where would we put it in the cache? And you have eight choices of places to put it. And then the third question we're going to ask is our replacement policy. When the cache is full, which byte do we pick to evict? Right, so three questions that we'll ask of any cache organization. Whether a byte's cached, where we put a byte in the, in the cache, and when the cache is full, what do we evict? So first example should be one that you're familiar with from 61C which is direct map caches. Right, so here, each byte is, in physical memory, is cached to a single location. And we're going to use the least significant bits of the address. So the last three bits are going to tell us where to put it. So what this means is these four addresses, 00, 100, 0, 1, 100, 1, 0, 100, 1, 1, 100, are all going to get cached to the same location in the cache. They're all going to be stored in the same location. Okay. Now, how do we know which one of those is cached? That's the role of the tag. The tag is going to be two bits that tells us the item is the one we're looking for. Right? So 0, 1, 100 is our tag. And that's our upper, most significant two bits becomes our tag. Okay. Now, how do we know um, which byte is cached? Well, the tag is storing the entire, uh, right, oops, I forgot what, um, one other thing. Um, when we're, the cache is full, which cache byte do we evict? And that will, again, be 100. All right. So that's direct mapped. Should be familiar to you, hopefully. Fully associative should also be familiar to you. So in this case, we can store a byte at any location. So the tag has to store the entire address. Right? So here it's going to store 0, 1, 100. Right? So how do we know whether an item is cached? We simply look through all of the tags and see if we find a matching tag. Where do we place a uh, an item that we want to cache? We can place it anywhere. If the cache is full, which cache byte do we uh, evict? That's going to depend on our replacement policy. And there are many different replacement policies that we could have. Any questions? All right, so some administrative stuff. So project one, uh, code is due tomorrow. Um, I think we only have uh, it was something like eight groups that are passing all of the public auto grader tests. So congratulations. <laughs> um, if you're one of the other. Uh, almost, uh, what is it, like, I think 28 other groups. Um, hopefully you are working away on your own test cases to try and figure out why you're not passing um, all of the auto grader test cases. Now, a very, very, very important caveat is there are eight public cases. There are a lot more private cases that we're going to actually use for grading your assignment. So simply passing all eight does not mean you're going to get 100%. Um, you want to make sure you are doing good testing um, to uh, exhaustively test your, your code. Question? Um, what would be the way of Oh, I, I think there's something like, there, there's like, uh, I want to say like 20 something uh, total test cases, I think. So, eight out of like 25 or something like that. So, um, Test early, test often. So um, if you're thinking of using slip days, please don't. I mean, they're yours to use. You have four. Uh, but I would strongly encourage you to save your slip days for later in the semester 
when you're going to be a lot busier and the projects are going to be uh, a lot more complicated. Um, so they're yours. Use them wisely. Um, design doc is due and group evaluations are due um, Wednesday at, by midnight. Um, very important, your design doc incorporates the feedback from your, your TAs and the changes that you've made. Um, group evaluations are anonymous to your group. So no one else in your group can see them, so please be honest. Uh, if people did extra work, say that. If they didn't pull their weight, say that. Um, we'll say this multiple times throughout the semester, but somehow or other, every semester we have one or two groups where you know, perfect division of points up until project three or sometimes project four, in which case there's suddenly an imbalance and they come and they complain that, you know, someone in their group hasn't been doing any work all semester long. So we'd like to see these problems early. We can deal with them uh, proactively if, we, uh, if you guys tell us early. Um, so those are anonymous. Please be honest. We have a midterm coming up in two weeks. Um, it's going to be divided between this classroom and 2060 Valley Life Sciences Building. It's closed book, double-sided, handwritten notes, um, and no calculators, smartphones, or other technological devices. It'll cover lectures 1 through 13. So that's 13 is the Wednesday lecture before uh, the, the Monday midterm. And uh, the readings, the handouts, and projects 1 and 2. So you should be familiar with all aspects of uh, the projects. Um, the TAs are going to hold a, a review session. They'll spend part of the time reviewing the material, but they're also going to expect you to bring lots and lots of questions. There are, uh, there's more than a decade's worth of midterms online, so there is no excuse not to do well on this midterm. Um, and you can see that many of the midterm problems are not identical, but are testing similar kinds of concepts. So don't be surprised if there's a CPU scheduling problem. Um, like lecture eight. Uh, any questions? Okay, so with that, I think we're going to take a little bit shorter break, like a three minute break.
Okay, so um, someone actually asked a, a, a good question, which is um, the division here is by last name. Okay, so um, let's dive down now and look at the actual details of what it looks like inside uh, a direct map cache. So the first thing is we take our uh, virtual, uh, we take our, our, our address, okay, so we have a 32-bit address here, this is a physical address, and um, we're gonna have the lower bits be uh, byte select, lower five bits, then we're gonna have a cache index, and we're gonna have a cache tag. Right? So very similar to the simple example, except now we're actually going to look at how it's laid out. So we're going to um, use the cache index to uh, figure out which line we store it in, okay? So it selects a cache block. Then we use the byte select to tell us which of the 32 bytes is the byte we want, okay? So five bits, two to the 30, to the five is 32. And um, then we use the cache tag to compare against the tag of this entry to see if this entry is actually what we're looking for. Right. Remember, with direct map, there's only one place it can go. And so if this does not equal, then we know it's not stored in the cache. Right. We also have to check the valid bit. So we're gonna do a comparison first and then we'll check the valid bit. If they all match, we have a hit and we have the byte we want. Okay, so we can return that byte. So, again, data that has the same cache index is gonna potentially cause us to have conflict misses. Because right, they'll all map to the same uh, line of the cache. Yes? Where are the cache tags stored? This is all stored in the cache, okay? If it's an L1, L2, or L3 cache, that's actually on the processor. Okay, L1 and L2 are in, in the same core. L3 is, is shared between multiple cores. Yeah. Are the cache tags like the name of the cache tag? The cache tag is, uh, it's the, yeah, it's kind of like the name. It's the unique identifier for this address and this entry. Why is it so huge? Why is it so huge? Because the uh, size of the cache, the number of cache lines is going di to dictate our cache index size. Right? And the size of our cache block is going to dictate the, number, the size of our uh, byte select. Right? Everything else is going to be tag. Right? So if we make our, our uh, block wider, right, then we'd have more bits for the byte select. If we added our more lines to our cache, we'd make our cache index wider. Right? And then the leftover bits are used as the unique tag to identify that entry with that physical address. Okay? All right. Now it's gonna get complicated. So we looked at fully associative caches where we could store anywhere. We looked at direct map caches where we could store it in one location. But as with everything in hardware, there's a middle ground. And the middle ground is what's called a set associative cache. So with a set associative cache, what we're gonna do is it's typically called an n-way set associative cache. The way to think about it is that we have, if given an n, we have n direct map caches that all operate in parallel. Okay, so we have our byte select, our cache index, and our cache tag. Now what we're gonna do is, instead of having a single place where we can store an item, we have, in this case, this is a two-way set associative cache. So we have two different places where we could store it. We could either store it in this set or we could store it in this set. So our set is made up of two cache lines. All right. So now what we're gonna do is we're going to compare the tags in parallel. All right. So we've now got two comparators for our two-way set associative cache. So we're gonna take our cache tag here, we're gonna take our cache tag, send it over here for that comparator, and we have to check the uh, valid bits, so that goes into our little AND gate, and um, we have to actually, so then if it matches, we're gonna use the byte select to select the appropriate byte, and then the MUX will tell us, so here we hit on the left side, and so in our set zero, 
So the MUX selects uh, this one, or actually I guess that's set one. So it selects this one, and that's what returned along with the indicator to say we had a hit. We found it. Okay? So this is the one that always confuses everybody. Two different places we can store it. If it was four-way set associative, four different places where we could store each uh, index. Okay, eight-way, eight different places. Yes? That's correct. The actual, the index tells us which line. The bytes that we're storing, these bytes that are, are uh, stored in the cache block, those came from memory. Right? We read 32 bytes at a time in from memory. Now, why do we read 32 bytes at a time? Spatial locality. Because right? if we've accessed one byte, we're likely to access bytes around it. So better to load 32 bytes at a time rather than loading one byte at a time. Okay. So we have eight-way set associative. We could go, we could just take that to infinity. If we made it completely as associative, that's the fully associative version. Okay, now in the fully associative version, we have our byte select, we get rid of the index because there is no place that we look to find it. We have to look everywhere. So now our cache tag is really long, 27 bits. We don't have the five bits of... Uh, of uh, index anymore, or uh, four bits rather of index anymore. So now um, we're going to compare the cache tags of all the cache entries in parallel. So here we have our block. Byte select tells us which byte. We have our valid bit, and our cache tag now has to be compared in parallel with all of the entries. All right, so if our cache has 512 entries, we need 512 comparators for our fully associative cache. Right? So the downside with this is the advantage here is we can put it anywhere, so we don't have to worry um, ab about uh, collisions. But the downside is we need a lot of hardware. And so that can actually make a fully associative cache, especially if it's big, be slow. Because you have to take this tag and you have to mux it out to all the comparators, then you have to mux back the answers from all the comparators and actually select the appropriate uh, line. So people typically don't build very, very big fully associative caches, maybe 64, 128, uh, 256 entries at, at max. Okay, so where do we place a block in the cache? In a, you know, so here we have block 12 in our 32 block uh, address space. We have an eight block cache. If we had a direct map cache, we would put it into one location. So for example, 12 mod eight. So we put it into uh, location, what is that? Location four. Okay. With a fully associative cache, we can put it anywhere. Right? We're gonna use the tag to determine where it's actually stored. In a set associative cache, it could go anywhere in set zero. So the key thing is when we compare a, uh, different cache organizations, we always have the same total number of cache entries. So in this case, we have an equal number of entries, eight entries. In the fully associative, there are eight choices. In the two-way set associative, there are two choices. In the um, uh, direct map, there's a single choice. Question in the back? Uh, yes. That's correct. Okay. Yeah, this is a four, this is actually a four-way set associative uh, cache. Okay. So, which block do we replace on a on a miss? So, for direct map, it's really easy, right? We only have to replace that one block. For set associative or fully associative, we have a couple of choices. Um, the most common ones that people use are random and LRU. Yeah, question? Sir, I had a question about that. I, I, that's a, a two-way or four-way set associative? Uh, which, oh, the one here? This is a... Uh, four sets or two ways? It is a two-way set associative. There are two places within each set that we can store it. Yeah, there are four sets, but it's two-way set associative. Yeah, that gets very confusing very quickly. Um, okay, so we have... 
a couple of choices. The most common choices that people use are random or LRU. LRU, least recently used, is a, attractive because um, typically if we've recently accessed something in the past, we're likely to access it again. Random is attractive because it's fast. It's incredibly easy to implement, and there's no state necessary. LRU, we have to keep track of when did we actually last access this item. So that can get very expensive. So um, typically, we don't use LRU in hardware. We use LRU in, in software implementation. So here's an example of, of some TLB misrates. This is just a, an application that someone ran. So this is running against a, a simulator of how would the, the TLB perform with different degrees of associativity and with different sizes and with different replacement policies. And a couple of immediate takeaways. One is we notice that the miss rate is higher for random than it is for LRU. Right? Random's just picking an entry and then shooting it to you know, replace it with another entry. Whereas LRU is trying to be a little bit more principled and, and taking into account temporal locality. So we expect uh, LRU to, to do better. Although, as we get to larger cache sizes, it actually turns out random does uh, much closer because the odds that we're going to you know, evict an entry that we're then going to go and reference are, are much, much smaller in the larger uh, cache sizes. Um, also, as we make the cache size larger, our uh, miss rate goes down. Although there are going to be diminishing returns, right? we go from 64 to 256, and the decrease is relatively small versus the decrease that we got from 16 to 64. We'll see more about this when we talk about working set sizes uh, later on in the semester. Um, we can also see that as we increase the uh, associativity, we also drop the uh, miss rate. Okay? So these are going to vary. You know, these numbers are going to vary depending on the application that you pick and its requirements for memory and its memory access patterns. Now, what happens on a write? We have two choices. When we have a write, we can either write through. This means that when we do the write, we actually write the write into the cache, and we write it back to memory. The other alternative is write back, where we just store the entry, the uh, updated information in the cache. Um, and then we only write that modified cache block back when we have to evict it. So now we have to keep track and be able to answer the question, is this block clean or dirty? Because if we want to replace it and it's dirty, we have to write it back to memory. So pros and cons. With write through, the advantage is that if we have a read miss, it's not going to result in a write. A read miss might cause us to evict someone. Right? With write through, we know every block in the cache is clean because we're writing through. So if the contents of memory match the contents of the cache. The downside is that processor writes could be delayed because we need to write it through to uh, main memory. And so we're going to need big write buffers uh, to make that work uh, on the processor. With write back, the advantage is if we're writing and updating the same counter value quickly, we don't actually have to reflect that to, to DRAM. So we're writing at 10 nanosecond speeds instead of 100 nanosecond speeds. The processor also is not held up on writes. All the writes get absorbed into the cache. The downside, though, is this is much more complex because we have to keep track of are things uh, clean or dirty, and now you know eviction requires potentially writing a, a modified block back. So read miss that causes you to have to evict something to have space in the cache could cause you to be blocked while you wait for the write back to occur. Right, so two different trade-offs, you know, and the choice of policy is going to depend on what you think your workload is going to look like whether you implement a write back or a write through. OK, so let's look at how, uh, so that was, yeah, question? Isn't that different for, for uh, CSL than the type of CSL? Right, so the question is, um, is uh, write back bad if our machine fails? Because right? you lose the writes. Well, if our machine fails, in this case, we'd lose our cache and our processor, but we'd also lose main memory. Um, if this was writing back to the disk, absolutely. Then, you know, that's a risk that you have to figure out whether you're willing to take, is if you're writing back to non-volatile storage, like a disk or an SSD, then, um, you know, you do have this window of vulnerability between when the data is written back and uh, any power failures or other crashes that occur. Yeah.
Sure. So, so the question is, um, could you be adaptive and have like some interrupt-driven uh, write-back uh, process? Absolutely. So um, when we look at the file system, we'll see how the buffer cache gets managed in, in a manner where periodically a timer interrupt goes off and you, you know, write back things to the disk to try and reduce the amount of uh, data that's, that's volatile in memory. Um, current processors usually use uh, write back because uh, you get performance and you don't have to worry about uh, you know uh, faults because you know it's shared fate if, if the machine crashes everything's lost not just the cache any other questions okay so we've looked at caching now we can apply and pull together everything and apply caching to address translation so remember the 621c picture, um, it's now going to get modified. So we're going to now take our virtual address spaces and we're going to look in a translation look aside buffer, which is a cache of translations. And if it's cached, then we have our physical address and we're done. If not, we're going to run the whole uh, translation process. So use our memory management unit to walk the page tables or the segment page, page tables or the page tables and page tables and save the result in the translation look aside buffer. And then we have our physical address again. Right? And uh, of course, the kernel can do untranslated reads and writes. So generate physical addresses, as you've probably seen in nachos. OK, so now, first question we can ask is, is there page locality? So is it valuable to cache a virtual page to physical page number translation? And the answer is yes. Right? So things like instruction access spends a lot of time on the same page because right? you tend to have sequences of instructions and then a branch. Most branches also tend to be very short, you know, maybe uh, 50 instructions or so. So a lot of times instructions are going to be spending the same time, a lot of time on the same page. So for that reason alone, PLB would be useful. Um, the stack right, has a lot of locality of reference because right? you're operating in the same stack frame, the local frame, um, repeatedly, right? Say you have an array or something that's stored in that. That'd be on the same page. And then less so, uh, to a lesser degree, data accesses. You know, so accesses to the heap um, are going to have some locality, like if I'm walking through the characters in a string. Right? That's going to reference the same. Um, but depending on how I walk through, say, the elements of an array, you know, my stride through that array may cross page boundaries or uh, may also remain on the same page bound, uh, within the same page. Now, can we have a hierarchy of TLBs? Absolutely. We could have multiple TLBs, as we'll see in a moment, of different sizes and, and speeds. So again, remember with two-level uh, paging, there's two sets of memory references that we had here in order to read a byte. Right? We had to read our top-level page table entry, then we had to read our second-level page table entry in order to be able to read our entry here. Right? So, what happens when we don't find something in the TLB? There's two choices. One is to do it in hardware, the other is to do it in software. If we do it in hardware, then when a fault occurs, a miss occurs, the hardware in the, in the memory management unit is going to look at the page table and walk through the page table. So it's going to do the translation process, fill the entry, and then if it finds that the page table entry is, is uh, valid, it'll fill in the TLB entry, and the processor never knows anything happened. It's completely transparent. It takes a, it's slow, but it, it's completely transparent. If the page table entry is marked as invalid, then it's going to generate a page fault. And we'll see on Wednesday what happens. But basically, the OS is going to have to go find the, the page and figure out what to do. Other choice is to do it in software. Right? As, as uh, you know, software programmers, anything they do in hardware, we can do in software and better. Um, so on a miss, the processor receives a fault. We trap into the uh, kernel, and then the kernel walks through the page tables to find the page table entry. If it, again, if it finds a valid page table entry, it fills in the TLB and returns from the fault. If it finds an invalid page table entry, it'll call the page fault handler internally. Right? Now, why did I say you know, anything we do in hardware, we can do in software better? Well, because in hardware, we can manage our TLB very simply. So like, for example, using a random replacement policy. In software, we could implement a much more sophisticated replacement policy. And since our TLB is small, the replacement policy could have a big impact 
on the performance as we saw from those example numbers. So architectures like the MIPS use a software traversed page table. Architectures like x86 use a hardware traversed uh, and managed uh, TLB. Okay, um, many chipsets though, you know, give you the, the option of, of doing it hardware-wise. Uh, but software, we can do a better job potentially, but it'll be slower. Okay, so what happens on a context switch? Um, we have a problem, right? Because the TLB is mapping virtual page numbers to physical page numbers, so we have to do something. We've changed the address space, so that mapping is no longer uh, valid. So we have a couple of choices. One choice, is to invalidate the entire TLB. So this is called flush the TLB. Right. Very simple, easy to implement. Just mark every entry as zero and, and invalid. But if we're doing a lot of context switching, this approach is not gonna work very well. Right? Because the first thing that's gonna happen when we context switch is we're gonna reload all those entries that we had from before back into memory because we're gonna walk all the page tables and do the translations all over again. The second choice is to actually include a process ID in the TLB. So now we need to make the TLB larger because it's gonna have to store mappings from multiple processes. Right? And then this gets into what our, our replacement policy is gonna be. This is also a solution that requires hardware support. Okay, now, what happens if we move a page from memory to disk or we um, delete a page or you know, unallocate it? We have to make sure we invalidate the TLB entry. And then it'll, it'll automatically get reloaded um, the next time we try to access that page. So if the page went out to disk, we'll walk through the page tables, discover it's out on disk, the page fault handler gets called, lots of magic happens that you'll hear about on Wednesday, and then we get a valid entry. Now, how should we organize our, our TLB? It has to be really fast because it's on the critical path for all memory accesses. And so that argues that we might want to have a, a direct mapped or low associativity uh, TLB, but we need the TLB to have very low conflict rate, right? And both direct mapped and low associativity uh, TLBs would have a uh, much higher conflict rate, right? The perfect solution for no conflicts is going to be um, to have a, um, where is it? Have a fully, uh, have a fully associative uh, TLB. Um, so the problem that we can have is if we, we have to pick some num bits to use as our index. Right? So if we say pick the low order bits to use as the index, then we'd have lots of collisions between the different regions of a program. The code, first page of code, first page of data, first page of the stack, and the, uh, uh, the second page of code, second page of data, second page of the stack would all collide. So we'd need to have at least three way set associativity to make this work without having, and a good replacement policy to avoid conflicts. Um, what if we use the high order bits instead as the index? Well, the high order bits are the high, large, uh, the high memory portions of a, a region, and for most programs, those aren't gonna be used, which means most of our TLB entries will not even actually be used. Right? So we wanna avoid thrashing, and so this is gonna argue that we're willing to tolerate a slightly increased cost of access, so a slightly higher hit time in exchange for a much uh, lower miss rate, okay? So the best organization is gonna be fully associative, and how big do we make it? Um, typically, it's not very big, 128 to 512 entries. So we can do fully associative. Um, lookup is by virtual address, and it gives us back the physical address, it gives us back the page table entry. So a bunch of other bits uh, can come along also. Now, what happens if a fully associative cache is too slow because we've got 512 comparators that all have to be mucked together? Well, we can actually have a hierarchy and put a very small, like four to 16 entry, direct map cache in front of the TLB. So if we miss in that TLB slice, then we'll look in our fully associative TLB and then we'll go to memory. All right. And this can work very well because most of your memory uh, accesses are typically in a program in a very small region. But this allows us to actually keep many, many more uh, addresses uh, mapped at the same time. Now, when should a TLB lookup occur relative to a memory cache access? It could either occur before we look in the cache 
or it could occur, which is you know, what we've thought about so far, or we can actually do it in parallel. Right? So now, put on your seatbelts. So the way I've talked about it up until now is to say we do our translation from virtual address to physical address. Then we take our physical address and take our byte select and our uh, index and our tag bits and use that to look up in the cache. All right? So that uh, gives us this picture. But it turns out that our offset is available immediately. Right? We know what the offset of the physical address is going to be because it doesn't change. Right? Unlike with segments, with pages, the offset is the same as the virtual address offset. So here's how we're going to organize our cache. We're going to organize our cache so that the offset exactly covers the byte select and the index bits of our physical address. Right. Now, we're going to organize our cache as follows. We have our TLB. In this case, it has uh, 32 entries. We're going to do an associative lookup in that for our physical page number. We have our cache. Our cache is four kilobytes in size. It, each uh, cache line is four bytes. Th thus, there are 1,024 entries. So that represents 10 bits. And our uh, index is going to be 10 bits. Right? Our byte select is going to be two bits, right? one of the four bytes here. So we can now immediately, as soon as we have a virtual address, take that offset, which represents these 12 bits, and look in the cache. Right? So we'll look in the cache and we'll do our byte select. Right? So what we'll, that will allow us to do is immediately fetch the physical address, the tag. Right? In the same, in parallel, we're looking up in the TLB, taking our uh, virtual address and getting back a physical address. Now, once both of those are ready, so we did both of those lookups in parallel to fetch those index on the right and an associative lookup on uh, the left, we can compare those physical addresses. If they match, we get a hit. Okay, if they're equal and, and the data is stored here, we get a hit. And then we can restore, return the data because we could already have done the byte select. Right. So this allows us to do both the physical to virtual address translation in parallel with the actual lookup of the byte in the cache um, with the physical address. Right? Kind of confusing. Um, spend some time after class uh, looking at it. Um, and if you really want to you know, kind of bend your mind, you know, think about what happens if we make the cache bigger. Right? Now this won't work because the overlap would not be complete. Right? We'd need um, another bit. So we'd need uh, 13 bits and our offset's only 12 bits. So if you want to know how to make that work, you know, that's a plug for taking uh, 152 or, or 252. Question? Exactly. Well, no, it does matter. So the question is, if, if the cache has a miss, does it matter what's in the TLB? Absolutely, it matters what's in the TLB because we're going to need to take that physical address and we're going to have to go to memory and request the byte from memory. Okay? And then we can load it into the cache. And we know now where to put it in the cache already because we've already looked up the index. Yes. So the cache is just producing the tag that was stored. So that's going to be a f the the tag is going to be the physical page number, right? It's going to be this physical page number that comes out of here, and we're then going to compare to see is that cache index, that cache line storing the right physical page. If it's not, then we still have to go to main memory. Okay, so really quickly, let me go through the last part, which is going to pull everything that we've seen together. All right, so we take our multi-level address. We take our page table pointer, which comes from the CPU register. We index for, for page level one in our page table. That gives us a pointer to physical memory for our second level page table. We take our second level page number, and that gives us an index into the second level table, which gives us a physical address the physical page number, we take our offset, and that then gives us an address that we can look up in memory with our offset. All right? We can replace that with a TLB. And with the TLB, now we're going to do our lookup in the TLB. 
and the TLB will return our physical page number. We can add a cache to this, and now we're going to take our physical address and break it up into a byte offset, an index, and a tag. We use the tag to, uh, uh, rather the index, to select a particular line. We use our tag to check whether we match. We use our byte select to select the actual byte that we want. That's it all on one slide. Okay? So in summary, um, the principle of locality is why all of this works. We have temporal locality, we have spatial locality in our programs. There are three plus one different types of misses, compulsory conflict, capacity, and coherence misses. And um, we looked at three different cache organizations, direct, set uh, associative, and fully associative. And the TLB is just a cache of address translations. And we can look up in parallel with our um, uh, actual lookup in the cache. Okay? See you on Wednesday. <laughs>